But he didn't have the fancy name, you know, it, Hopeful Monster. That didn't sound nearly scientific. Now then, Google says he thinks uh, that Goldsmith would be vindicated, and he says it's punctuated equilibria, which is similar. Well, uh, let's let Stanley describe how this works. Uh, writing in his uh, book, he says, the record now reveals that species typically survive for 100,000 generations, even a million or more, without evolving very much. This is that principle of stasis that dominates the record. They don't change, as Gould acknowledged. You don't see that. All right? That's what we see in the fossil record. We've documented that. What does that mean? Well, he tells you what that means. We seem forced to conclude that most evolution takes place rapidly. Oh, I can see how that falls. <laughs> you see, if you begin with the absolute unquestioned faith that it happened, and you don't see it happening gradually, then it must have happened rapidly. It went so fast you didn't see it. And that's exactly what they're telling us. Continuing with Stanley's statement, he says a punctuational model of evolution, that's what he's describing here, is, is operated by a natural mechanism. He wants you to know it's natural. It may look supernatural, <laughs> but no, no, it's a natural, and he won't tell you what the mechanism is because they really don't have a good mechanism for changing so fast. It did, well, they just sort of sped up the old one, but anyway, he says it's a natural mechanism whose major effects are wrought exactly where we're least able to study them small, localized, transitory populations. You can't see it, see? It went so fast, you can't see it. It happened out here where nobody can, can watch it happen. The point here is that if the transition was typically rapid, the population small and localized, fossil evidence of the event would never be found. Well, isn't that nice? What is science supposed to be but the evidence in the rocks that we follow. Oh no, the, the, the evidence is lying to us again. <laughs> it must be there even though we don't see it. But now we've come up with a story about why we don't see it and that's science and that's the answer and now we can be proud because we've solved the problem. We've just basically come up with a story. Now, Notice where this leads them. They don't really have fossils to support this evolutionary, and, and they not only say they don't have it, but they can't find it and won't find it. Just don't even look anymore. And Gould has acknowledged, as well as many of the other leading authorities, that these small changes don't add up to the big ones, as we saw earlier in the series. He doesn't have a mechanism, certainly not the mechanism in the textbooks. He says mutation is doesn't produce major new raw material. You don't make a new species by mutating the species. It's a common idea people have that evolution is due to random mutation. The mutation is not the cause of ev These <laughs> processes, these mechanisms taught in the textbook are not what does it. You don't have fossils. You don't have mechanisms. Now, let's, let's compare the two modes of explanation here. On the one hand, you have punctuated equilibrium with evolutionary explanations that depend on unobserved mechanisms and unobserved fossils and assurances you'll never find them, compared with mechanisms that we see every day, kind reproducing after kind. You ever seen that? <laughs> That's what you see. And billions and billions of fossils that show a sudden and complex beginning and distinct separate kinds, and as we have seen, millions billions of generations without change. The principle of state. We observe fossils, we observe mechanisms, and we follow the implications. On the other hand, you've got unobserved mechanisms and unobserved fossils. Now, is it really difficult to determine which is better science? I think it's obvious which is better science. We're not talking about implications of Sunday school lessons. We're talking about the positive evidence of the fossils that support the creation model. Billions of fossils that show very distinctly evidence that would support the creation model more. Now, some have responded in various ways. Notice the response of Colin Patterson. Again, senior paleontologist for the, the biggest fossil museum in the world, British Museum of Natural History. Well, it seemed to me they've accepted the fossil record doesn't give them the support they would value, so they searched around to find another one and found one. When you haven't got the evidence, you make up a story that will fit the lack of evidence. Now, that's not science. It's a scenario. It's a story, which Colin Patterson just frankly acknowledges. 
Still others take a different tack. <laughs> Interestingly, we see Mark Ridley of Oxford saying, no, we don't even use the fossils anymore. He says a lot of people just do not know what evidence the theory of evolution stands on. Okay, we don't know. What, what is it we think? They think that the main evidence is the gradual descent of one species from another in the fossil record. Well, yes, that's supposed to be the evidence. As Stanley says, the only documentary evidence, <laughs> the only real proof would have to be here. He says, without this, it's just an outrageous hypothesis, you recall? Many people think that. Well, yes, that, but he says, no, that's not the case. In any case, he says, no real evolutionist, whether gradualist or punctuationalist, uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of the theory of evolution as opposed to special creation. No, well, that's, of course, not true, but this is the way he approaches it now. You don't use the fossil record. Well, why not? Believe me, he would if he could. If it said what he wanted it to say, he would be preaching it. But the more we've learned about it, the more we've seen it doesn't, and so he just walks away. It kind of reminds me of Aesop's fable where the fox was just jumping and working hard, long and hard to get those grapes and finally couldn't and gave up and said, I didn't want those grapes, they were sour. Now, he got some sour fossils. He tried and tried for over 100 years and uh, tried to fill in those gaps and show the change in the fossils. Well, no, we don't even use fossils anymore. Just, uh, we, don't, we don't want those. <laughs> Is that uh, obvious or what? I use the fossils. The fossils belong to the creationists because that's what they're telling us. That's the dramatic picture that we see in the positive evidence portrayed by the fossil record. E.J. H. Corner of Cambridge is talking about his field in botany, but it's the same picture that we see throughout the fossil record. Much evidence can be adduced, he says, in favor of the theory of evolution from biology and biogeography and paleontology, but I still think to the unprejudiced, the fossil record of plants is in favor of special creation. And why does he say that? Sudden complex beginning. You don't see the change documented in the fossil record. Separate distinct kinds. It says special creation, and he acknowledges that, and that's what we see when we look at the fossil record. Let's summarize it this way. In the critical beginning, we see sudden, complex, diverse fossils. We see all of the major phyla, and they're none new since. We see these trees of life representing change, but they're not from the fossil record. They're not from embryology, from uh, common genetics. They're better explained, I would say, by common designer, because when we look at the similarities, it reveals not the branching pattern, but similarities that are just all over the place randomly uh, in cockroaches and in butter beans and in chickens, a mosaic pattern of similarity that you can line up either from pig to bull to man or from ape to man, depending on who arbitrarily selects the similarities and ignores others. The evidence, the fossil record, delights the creationist according to the evolutionist and embarrasses the evolutionist according to the evolutionist. The evidence was Darwin's biggest problem then and it's worse now because there are fewer examples. The links, according to the leading evolutionists, have one by one been debunked so that some say there's not any left. Their blind faith postulates the existence, they say, evolution, but the actual fossils themselves, according to the implications which they acknowledge, speak. And they speak loudly and clearly and eloquently, billions of them positively, in favor of the theory of creation. I think the creation model is obviously supported much better by the fossil record for the reasons we've discussed. It's not uh, a matter of blind faith. It's just following the truth, the evidence, wherever we find it.